to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Whatever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17. Welcome to our second part in our series of lessons dealing with what are the differences. What's the difference between the Church of Christ and various religious groups started by men? Is there any difference? Why should I study or be a part of the Lord's body? What's unique about the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ? In our last lesson, we noticed four differences between the Church of Christ and other religious groups. As way of reminder, here they are again. The structure of authority in the Lord's Church is different. That is, we don't have a hierarchy. There isn't an earthly headquarters. We don't have a one man who is the leader here on earth. Each individual member is amenable to God. The Word of God is already settled in heaven, Psalm 1, 1989. Jesus is still the head of the church, and our source of authority is also different. We don't look to men. We don't look to the writings of the church fathers. We don't have some creed book or book of discipline. The Bible is our only authority. The Scripture says in 1 Peter 4, verse 11, that we are to speak as the oracles of God. We believe in going by the Bible and the Bible only. But also we noted that the name of the Lord's church is different. By name we mean biblical description. The names that you read about in the New Testament, Church of Christ, Romans 16 verse 16, Church of God, 2 Corinthians 1 verse 2, the church that Jesus built, Matthew 16 verse 18, all of these are descriptions of ownership. They describe who we belong to. We don't belong to some man. There's no authority in, in the Bible of naming a religious group after maybe religious leaders. There's only authority for following the teaching of Christ. And then the fourth one that we noticed in our last lesson was that the plea for unity is different. Jesus prayed that they would all be one. John 17 verses 20 and 21. The plea inside the Lord's body is that men and women will be united on truth. Ephesians 4 verse 3, that we'll endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And so we plead for unity as the Bible, with the Bible as our only guide in all religious matters. Today we're also going to notice four more differences between the church that you read about in the Bible and religious groups that exist today. The first is the music is different. One of the most obvious differences between Church of Christ and other religious groups is the singing. We believe and teach, as do the scriptures, that a cappella music, singing with the voice, is what God has asked for in the New Testament. Now some people will say, well, Church of Christ, you don't believe in music. No, that's not true. We believe in singing. We believe in music. God has commanded that. But there is no authority for mechanical instruments of music anywhere in the New Testament. Now as we state this, understand that we're living in the Christian age today. We're living under the authority of the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 14 as well as Colossians 2 verse 14 teach that the old law has been abolished and it's been nailed to the cross. The Hebrews writers said that the old law is an obsolete law that was vanishing away during the time of the writing of the New Testament. Hebrews 8 verses 12 and 13. It is a dead law for us, Romans 7, 1 through 4, and we're not going to be judged by that law. We're going to be judged today by the law of Christ, John 12 verse 48. And so we're not asking 
What did people do under the Old Testament? We're asking, is there any authority in the New Testament for mechanical instruments of music? And here's the problem. There isn't one reference in the New Testament to the church on earth ever using mechanical instruments. Everything the Bible says about music, singing, is a cappella. Romans 15, 9, singing. Colossians 3, 16, we've got singing. Hebrews 2, verse 12, I will sing of you in the assembly. James 5, verse 13, is any among you happy? Let him sing. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 15, I'll pray with the spirit and the understanding. I'll sing with the spirit and the understanding. Think about Paul as he is in prison in Philippi. The Bible says in Acts 16, verse 25, that they were praying and singing hymns and the prisoners we're listening to them. Think about what Jesus and His disciples did. Matthew 26, verse 30, they sang a hymn and went out. But to show that God wants singing, we need to look at the words of Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19. What is it that God asks from the church today concerning singing? Notice these words. The scripture says, we are to be speaking to one another in Psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, notice singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Concerning singing, what does God want? He wants speaking. Speaking in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Songs, some from scripture, like the psalms, some relative to spiritual things written by others that are biblical, and hymns, that which glorifies and honors God. And so we speak in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We sing one to another. That's a reciprocal idea. Colossians 3.16 teaches that in our singing we teach and admonish one another. And notice this, singing and making melody, where? On an organ? On a piano? On a drum set? On a guitar? No, God says making melody in your heart. How do we sing acceptably to God by making melody in our heart? Well, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15 is an explanation of that. I'll sing with the Spirit. That's my heart. I, all my emotion, my zeal, my desire is in that. I'll sing with the Spirit and I'll sing with the understanding. When our mind's engaged and our motion is engaged and we're governed by the Word of God and the songs that we sing, then truly we're worshiping God acceptably. You see, Christians only do that which we are specifically told to do. Someone says, well, yeah, I see what you're saying there, but the Bible never says that instruments are wrong. Sure, it says to sing, but God doesn't say don't use the instrument. The problem with that is this. When God tells us what He wants, that's all He wants. We're not to add to or take away from the Word of God. Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. Uh, Paul illustrates this in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. And oh, how I wish people could understand the principle of this great passage. Notice Paul is showing some things through himself and Apollos. And look at what he here says. Paul says, Christians are told not to think beyond that which is written. Now think about that little phrase. We're not to think beyond that which is written. If we could just get it ingrained in our minds, if the Bible doesn't say it, I'm not even to think about it. If it's not written and you can't find it in the Bible, you can't find mu musical mechanical instruments in the New Testament, if it's not in there, we're not to think beyond that which is written. Well, God didn't specifically condemn it. We don't work that way in other areas of life. For example, let's say that you're going to order a pizza and you call up the local pizza shop and you say to them, I want a large pizza with pepperoni and black olives. And they say, okay, it'll be about 30 minutes. Doorbell rings, you answer the door, pizza's there, the guy's there delivering it. You open the pizza up and it's got pepperoni and it's got black olives, but it also has anchovies and pineapples on it. Are you gonna take that? You'd say, well, I didn't tell you to put that on there. How would you respond if that fella said, you didn't say not to? Would you say, oh, oh yeah, you're right, so I guess I will take it? You'd say, no, when I told you what I wanted, that was all I wanted, and that excluded everything else. 
God works the same way. When God tells us what He wants, sing, make melody in your heart, and there's no mention of mechanical instruments, God doesn't need us adding what we want into worship. Where did mechanical instruments come from? They were brought in hundreds of years after the New Testament church was started. They were brought in by man. And so the music that we use is different. We believe you must only worship God with the voice. That's what's authorized in Scripture. Another difference is the weekly observance of the Lord's Supper. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 29, Jesus taught about the Lord's Supper. He taught that it was the, the, the unleavened bread rep represented His body, that the fruit of the vine represented His blood, and that we were to take that when the kingdom came into place. The Lord's Supper is to be observed until Christ comes again. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. It's a continual practice God has put in order for the church to observe. Well, how often are we to observe the Lord's Supper? Christmas and Easter? Uh, once a month when we feel like it? What does the Scripture say? concerning the observance of the Lord's Supper. Is it just something God has left up to us? Absolutely not. The Scriptures teach us to observe the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. Now, there are a couple of passages I want you to think about. In Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8, God said to Israel, Remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. Now, how often did they remember the Sabbath? Once a month? on special holidays or special days? No, they took that language and correctly interpreted it to mean every Sabbath that rolled around, they were to keep it. Well, the same is true when God uses the language in the New Testament. For example, notice the words of Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. How often did New Testament Christians observe the Lord's Supper? Notice what the Scripture says. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. On the first day of the week, when they came together, for what purpose? To break bread. Christians were coming together with one of the central purposes, remembering the Lord's death. We learn from 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 that they were coming every first day of the week. If they were coming every first day of the week, if every week has a first day, then we need to observe the Lord's Supper on the first day of every week. That's how they did it in the first century, and that's what we need to do today. Well, someone says, why on the first day of the week? Jesus was raised from the dead on the first day of the week. The first day of the week has great significance. Jesus was raised from the dead on the first day of the week, Matthew 28, verse 1. If you look at the Jewish calendar, Pentecost, when the church began, was on the first day of the week, Acts chapter 2. Jesus assembled with His disciples after His resurrection on the first day of the week. Christians met on the first day of the week over and over again. His ascension, Acts 1, verse 3, was on the first day of the week. The first day of the week, not the Sabbath, is the day that has significance for Christians. Someone says, if not on the first day of the week, how can we know? How can we know when we should partake? That's exactly right. If not on the first day of every week, then when do we take? There's no authority for just doing it on what people call Christmas and Easter. There, there's no authority in here for doing it just on the first of the month or once a month. God has given us specific instructions on when to observe the Lord's Supper. But here's what I find interesting about this. People seem to get confused when it comes to Acts chapter 20 and verse 7 and say, well, how can we know that we need to keep the Lord's Supper every first day of the week? They don't seem to have that problem when it comes to collecting funds. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 basically has the same language. When we come together, we're to lay by in store on the first day of the week. Why is it that people can understand when it comes to giving that's every first day of the week. Everywhere you go, people are usually going to give every first day of the week. We understand it in one place, but we don't understand in the other. That even shows the inconsistency in our belief. And so the New Testament church is unique 
because of the music that we use. God has only authorized singing. It's unique because we observe the Lord's Supper like first century Christians on the first day of every week. The Lord's Church is also unique because the teaching of salvation in Christ's church, in the church that Jesus died for, is different than what so many teach today. There are various and diverse teachings on salvation out there today. Some say God elects us with no action on our part, that the elected cannot reject or resist salvation. Others say that you know some are predestined to go to heaven, some are predestined to go to hell. Many say that once a person is saved, it's at the point of belief. All you gotta do is believe. Some will teach that you need to say the sinner's prayer and accept Jesus in your heart. Uh, some will say just lay your hand on the television and you'll be saved. There are a host, a multitude of different beliefs concerning salvation we're only concerned with one what does the Bible teach about salvation be sure God does not teach the Calvinistic idea of predestination each of us can choose for ourselves this day whom we will serve Joshua 24 verse 15 we can make sure that our calling and election is sure. 2 Peter 1 and verse 10. Each of us can be sure that it's not at the point of belief alone that we're saved. James 2 verse 24 says, We see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. The only time faith only occurs in the Bible, God says the exact opposite. And you can be sure that salvation doesn't come from saying the sinner's prayer or laying one's hand on a television or radio. In fact, Usually you'll hear the sinner's prayer go something like this. Dear Jesus, I recognize you as Savior of my life and I now ask you to come into my heart and save me. That's similar to how some of them will be. Some are different. What I ask is this. Where's that at in the New Testament? And here's what's amazing. You can read from Matthew all the way through Revelation and you won't find the sinner's prayer one time in Scripture. Billy Graham and others have said it like it's on every page of the Bible. Where's the sinner's prayer at in the Bible? Well, you can look and look and look and you won't find it. Why not? It's not in there. Acts chapter 9 verses 11 through 13 might be the closest you get and the man who was doing it wasn't saved yet. Paul was praying three days and yet he still had to obey God in baptism when Ananias came to him. Acts 22 verse 16, if there was ever a man who was praying a many a sinner's prayer, it was Saul and he wasn't saved till he obeyed God concerning baptism. And so what does the church teach, God's New Testament church teach about salvation? Same thing the Bible teaches. You've got to hear the Word of God. Romans 10 verse 17 says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Once you've heard that Word, you recognize it's the only authority for salvation. You then must believe in Jesus. We learn that belief is essential. Jesus taught, unless you believe that I am He, you'll surely die in your sins. John chapter 8 and verse 24. You must be willing to repent. Acts 2 verse 38, they were told to repent and be baptized for the remission of their sins. A person must be willing to confess Jesus as the Son of God and Savior of the world. In Romans 10 verse 10, the Bible says, with the heart, the mind, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It's something I do because it's God's part of God's plan for salvation. And then the scriptures do teach that a person must be baptized before they're saved. So many people in our world say you're baptized after you're saved, you're saved at the point of belief, and baptism is just something you do to identify yourselves with Christians. It's not what the Bible says. Notice what the scripture teaches concerning baptism in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. They made that great request of men and brethren, what shall we do? And look at the answer. And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Notice this, for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What's the purpose in baptism, according to Acts 2 verse 38, it's not to be identified but to show that you're already saved. 
It's for the forgiveness of sins. Well, someone says, well, how does that teach baptisms essential? Remember what it is that separates us from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says our sins separate us from God. If sin separates me from God, then the moment my sins are forgiven is the moment I can know I'm saved. When are sins forgiven? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. What makes the church of the Lord unique concerning its teaching on salvation is that our teaching about baptism is in line with the teaching of God. Mark 16, verse 16, Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Did Jesus say baptism was after salvation? No, not at all. Jesus said in John 3, verse 5, Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Peter said baptism does now also save us. Paul said in Galatians 3, 27, that we're baptized into Christ. If all spiritual blessings are in Christ, Ephesians 1 verse 3, if salvation is in Christ, 2 Timothy 2 verses 10 through 12, and if baptism puts me into Christ, then I cannot have all spiritual blessings and salvation until I obey God's teaching concerning baptism. And so yes, baptism is essential to salvation. If someone says to you today, baptism has nothing to do with salvation, you can know they're not a part of the group you read about in the New Testament. Well, there's one other thing we want to note today. Another difference between the church that you read about in the New Testament and religious groups of men is the teaching of the security of the believer. By that we mean many teach that once you're saved, you can never be lost. This doctrine is known as once saved, always saved, or the idea that you can't fall from grace. Basically, it says... Once you become a Christian, you are eternally secure and no matter what may happen, no matter what you may do, you can't go to hell and logically, take it to its logical end, you couldn't go to hell if you wanted to. Was well, that what the Bible teaches? Not at all. There are clear-cut examples that show us that one can fall from grace. Probably the clearest is the example of Simon. In Acts chapter 8, Philip goes down to Samaria and preaches the gospel to them. Simon's there. He also obeys the gospel and is baptized. And we learn that Simon's former trade was that like a magician. He had been tricking people. But now, through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he sees that the gift of the Holy Spirit is given. And here's what he says. After he's a Christian, he says, I'll give you money. I'll buy that gift from you. And Peter says, you have neither part nor portion in this matter. Your heart is not right with God. Listen to this now, Acts 8, verse 20 following. Peter said to a man who was a Christian and who had been saved, your money perish with you. What did Peter say was going to happen to Simon? If he didn't repent, he was going to perish. What's that mean? He was going to be lost. I want you to think about other examples. Hymenaeus and Alexander, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, Paul said, I've delivered them to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. What's, they were under Satan's control. They were under his grip. They were going to be lost with Satan and all the angels, if they are all the angels of Satan, if they did not repent. Think about Demas, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10. The scripture says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. What about Judas? Even one of the closest of Jesus was lost. Acts chapter 1 verse 25. The children of Israel, some of them were lost. Take heed lest ye fall just as they did. There are some undeniable scriptures that clearly teach a person can fall from grace. Probably the clearest is Galatians 5 verse 4. Now before we look there, I want you to think about this. Here's what men say today. Men say can't fall from grace. You know what's great about the Bible? God takes the exact language of false teachers and shows their error using their own language. Look at Galatians 5 verse 4. The scripture says, You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law. Notice, you have fallen from grace. Who's Paul writing to in the book of Galatians? He's writing to the churches of Christ in Galatia. Galatians 1, 1 following. He's writing to Christians who are thinking about going back to the old law. And he says, you'll be cut off from Christ. 
you'll be estranged from him. You have fallen from grace. Now someone says, well, they just fell away from the center of grace. They were still in the circle of it. That's not the language of the New Testament. The little Greek word is ek, and that means out of. You were in God's grace, now you're out of it. Can a person be saved outside the grace of God? Absolutely not. Jesus taught, it's not everybody who just says, Lord, Lord, that's going to heaven, but he who does the will of the Father. Revelation 3, verse 5, certain Christians were going to have their names written out of the book of life if they weren't faithful. And so over and over again, we see that a person can fall from grace. Now, should a person? No, God's given us everything we need to be faithful. It's possible that it can happen, but we should not fall from God's grace. And so what is it? that makes the church of Christ different. We follow the New Testament pattern concerning music. We sing and make melody in your heart. We follow the weekly observance of the Lord's Supper just as they did in Acts 20 verse 7. We teach God's full plan of salvation including what the scripture says baptism is for the remission of sins and we teach as does the scripture that a Christian can fall from grace and therefore we must be faithful until death. Friend, are you sure that you're a part of the church you read about in the New Testament? Or have you got caught up in the teaching of men? Uh, can you find the church that you're a part of mentioned in the pages of this book? If not, how can you follow God's authority and be in that group? We've got to make sure We've got to check and double check to make sure that what we believe, what we've been taught, what we've heard others say is true to the book. Remember, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. A lot of people will say, well, I think that's right. I believe this is right. Mom and Dad believe this is right. Don't do that. You ask the question, what does the scripture say? Romans 4 verse 3. Ask the question of Jeremiah 37 verse 17. Is there any word from the Lord? And so we want to encourage you to study your Bible, to make sure that you're in the right church, to make sure that you're right with God, because friend, your soul is the most important thing you have, and we're begging with you today. We're begging you, make sure you're right before you stand before the judgment of God. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.